Please open your Bibles to 1 John chapter 3. We'll look at verses uh, 4 through 10 this morning. You know, as we sing that song, it's a wonderful Christmas carol, right? And that's just a beautiful carol. And it has that line, the, the thrill of hope, the weary world rejoices. Isn't that true? Maybe for three of us that might be true. But <laughs> Isn't that true, right? The thrill of hope. We think about if Christ doesn't come into this world, right? Everything we've been talking about is, is out the window, right? If we look at Scripture, none of it has bearing or meaning or weight if Christ doesn't come, right? I mean, it's all about him. And you think about the passage last week where he talks about, you know, John was talking about hope, right? We have this hope. We know Christ is coming when he is revealed. He says it in the first verses of chapter 3. When he is revealed, right? We have this hope. We're going to look into his eyes, and we don't want to be part of that group that is ashamed. As he says at the end of chapter 2, we want to, to embrace him and have and, and know that this hope is a wonderful motivator, right? To press on in our purity, so we talked about hope last week, and this morning, I've titled this message, Sin in the Christian Life, right? Right from hope straight to sin. That's how this is going to play out for us, right? Well, it's in the context of this passage where clearly John has in mind the idea of Christ is coming, right? He's been, he's been walking us through all these things. He's been talking and telling us about God. He's been, he's been telling us our, our need for a Savior, right? If we say we have not sinned. Right? If you get to this place where you're justifying sin and kind of saying, well, it's, you know, it's, a, you know, it's, it's all right. And he's saying, well, you're missing it. Right? You're, you're, you're getting to that place where at some point you have to look at God and say, you know what? God is lying about this. And none of us would want to ever think to do that. John is saying, this is, this is how this works out in our lives. And so he talks about all these things and he brings us through these tests and he wants us to have confidence and assurance that we have eternal life. And not only that, but that believers would continue, right, to live out this faith and continue to press on and pursue the Savior. So he sets that in this context, this idea of hope. But here he goes into this idea that there is, there is sin, right? We don't like to admit that sometimes, but yeah, we, we struggle with sin, even as believers. With the power to turn from sin, we have the feeling of the Holy Spirit, yet we also struggle with things in our lives. And John wants us to take a real hard look, a true look at these things, acknowledge them for what they are, right, and move forward. So last week we looked at hope, and, and, and the idea of pursuing purity was, in the, was contrasted with hope a little bit, right? He says, Jesus is coming. We know. I love how John just phrases all this, man, without, I mean, with, with no doubt, right, with complete confidence. He's saying we, we know Christ is coming. It's not like I have to just, just even explain that to you. This is a fact, Christ is coming, and because of that, pursue your purity. And in this passage that we're going to look at, these verses this morning, he's, he's kind of contrasting this idea that, that there is sin, right? And, and our hope and our response to that is righteousness, right? The Christian life, pursuing. We, it draws us right back to all these tests that John has been saying. And for us, I think the struggle is, is really just acknowledging it. Maybe I'm, I'm right or wrong on that, but... You know, maybe there's, there's areas in your life where you think, well, let's see if we just justify this. It's, it's a necessary evil, right? And pretty soon it just, just becomes necessary. We just get rid of the evil word, right? And we kind of we do things. It reminds me of a story of a, of a police officer who was out on patrol, and he saw a man swerving as he went driving by. And so he turns his lights on, and he pulls him over. He says, sir, do you, you realize that you were swerving? And the man says, Oh, I, you know, I was just trying to go home. I wasn't aware of that. I was, you know, caught off guard. I was thinking if something else makes an excuse. And the police officer being attentive as he is, he notices something on the front seat. And he says, well, sir, what's that? What's that bottle in the front seat there? To which the man says, oh, that's, uh, that's water. The police officer says, well, let me, let me see that. Let me see that bottle. So he hands over the bottle to the man. And he says, sir, this isn't water. This is wine which the man looks up heavenward and says, he did it again. <laughs> it's not my fault. The Lord did it again. He turned some water into wine. How did that happen? And in this walk, right, in this life that you live, you, you and I are going to struggle here. And John is very real about these truths. And he says, look, this is, there is. Don't deny it. Don't, don't 
sugarcoat it, don't call it anything else. Realize that if it heads down this road, you get to a point of saying, well, maybe we just don't need a Savior because God's not really true about sin. No, God is very serious about sin. It, doesn't take, it takes us all two seconds to come to the cross and go, yeah, God is very serious about sin. Right? And John wants us to understand that, but he also doesn't just say, hey, look, here's sin. Here you go. Good luck with that. Right? He unfolds for us once again the grace, the mercy we find in Christ, the power of God to walk with us, and our response to that. Okay, so let's look at these passages this morning, starting in verse 4. And we'll read through verse 10. He says, Whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness. And sin is lawlessness. And you know that he was manifested to take away our sins, and in him there is no sin. Whoever abides in him does not sin. Whoever sins has neither seen him nor known him. Little children, let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. He who sins is of the devil. For the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. Whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him, and he cannot sin, because he has been born of God. And in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. Let me offer a brief prayer this morning. Father, we do thank you for the truth of your word. And Lord, it is our desire that this morning we would not just hear, Lord, your word, but we would understand it to the point of we see it active and changing us. So, Lord, I pray that every eye would be fixed upon you, and, uh, Lord, every life be fixed upon you, and that you would take me out of the way for that purpose. So I pray your blessing upon this time. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> so this morning, as I mentioned earlier, John has, has picked up on some themes, right? And he kind of re-brings them about. He's told you before, he's, he's given us these tests that you would have just confidence. You would have assurance that you are saved. He says that in chapter 5, right? That you would know that you are saved. This is, how, this is how it's done, right? You would have this knowledge. You wouldn't meander through this world and wondering here and about and, and hope maybe, maybe 50-50 God will, God will bring me in. But no, he says in great confidence that if you have Christ, right? It's God's means of salvation. He uses that wonderful word, propitiation. It is God's means for saving us. And if you know him, you can have wonderful confidence. And John says, look, if you have that truth and you've believed on Christ, here are some things that should be happening in your life, right? We call them, I've been referring to them as tests. Now, I want to qualify that because I was thinking about that this morning. I use this word, and I don't know, sometimes you think of tests, you go, well, if I pass the test, I'm, I'm done, right? I'm good. I don't have to do anything else. And it's not that way. I don't want you to interpret it that way. We use these as indicators. Maybe that's the better word, right? To indicate our fellowship with Christ is to say what? Well, there is a growth in righteousness. There is a desire in righteousness, right? Does it mean that I'm, I arrive and become perfect? We understand from Scripture that God who began this good work, He is the one who is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ. So if you're breathing this morning, right? I think everyone is. And that you know Christ as your Savior, well, then you know that you are in process. And these tests, these indicators are for our growth and our confidence. You know, this time of year is, is we always get to this new year. I don't know if you're like me, you have New Year's resolutions, and you look, kind of look back on the, on the year previous, and you think, well, I did good or I did bad or vice versa, however you assess that, and you reset your new agenda, your new goals, right? And these indicators can work like that, where we look back and say, my growth in righteousness from last year has has been to this. That's a good thing, and here's my new goal for the future. I'm going to move forward. And John kind of uses these this way. You should be growing in your righteousness. You never arrive or pass the test and think I'm good enough. We just keep pressing on that we have Christ. And he uses love, right? Isn't that a great indicator? Love. Do you have love for God's church? Do you have love for your brothers and sisters? Do you have a love that you want to be here? Right? It's not church. It's not one on Sunday where it's like, oh, man, it's Sunday again. Right? Hopefully none of you are like that. I feel like that. No, I'm kidding. <laughs> we shouldn't feel that way, right? There is a joy being with God's people together, lifting our voices and praising Him. We realize that a praise of a lifetime would never be enough because God is wonderful. We have such wonderful joy and grace in Him. We say, yes, I want to be here. 
right? Is that growing in you? That becomes an indicator, right? That we can say, you know what? I know the king because I want to be close to the king. I want to be around those who also know the king. I want to I take God's commands and the commands of Jesus. I want to follow them. So John says these are indicators. These are how this develops in you, right? And he goes on to truth. Many have a desire for God's truth. You want to grab onto it. Let go of this world. He says it's passing away. Let go of these things and grab onto this. So he brings some of those themes right back into what we're talking about this morning is dealing with sin, right? All of chapter 1, it seems like he's been talking about sin. You're like, John, come on. Man, sin again, right? But he comes to this, and it's very important. It's very important that we understand that in our life there is sin. So we look at these verses. And there's a, one thing that I want you to understand is there, there are really kind of two passages here. Verses 4 through 7 deal with four things, and verses 8 through 10 deal with the same four things, right? If you look at verses 4 through 7, he's talking about the nature of sin. He's talking about the work of Jesus Christ in opposition to sin, right? How Jesus dealt with it. He talks about the, the unsustainability of continuing in sin while being the Christian, right? You can't continue in this. There's a problem if you profess to know Christ. And then he has a conclusion, right? The person pursuing Christ is going to grow in righteousness. We see that conclusion in the end of chapter 2. If you know that he is righteous, well, then those who are practicing righteousness are of Christ, okay? And then verses 8 through 10, very similar, a little bit more detail, maybe, we could say. He covers the origin of sin. He talks about the work of Christ in defeating the devil, which we all said, amen, right? The fact that you are a true child of God and you can't continue in sin. And then he has another conclusion, right, that the children of God are known by righteousness. And he goes on to say there are other children, those of the devil, and they are known as well, right? They practice sin. So we're going to look at these together. So you'll, you'll notice, I don't know if I remember, I put it in the outline, uh, the two verses kind of in, in parallel. I'll put them together and we'll read them together. So verse 4 and, and first part of 8a and, and, and so on and so forth. And so this comes to my first point. This is as we look at these two passages, the first thing that you and I have to realize, and this may not be a shocker, maybe it is to you this morning, there is a reality. In reality, there is sin. Right? It's the reality of sin, and John wants you to kind of square up to this and look at it in the eyes, if you will, and deal with it appropriately. Look in verse 4. He says, whoever commits sin also commits lawlessness, and sin is lawlessness. And then he says in verse 8, the first part of verse 8, he says, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. All right, so there's a reality of sin. John gives us a definition, if you will. Here is a de definition of sin. It is lawlessness, and pretty much we're all guilty of it, right? Thanks, John, right? We also must understand it's not a comprehensive or a complete definition. It's a very succinct definition. And the idea of lawlessness is tied to the Old Testament, right? You think of law, you go right to the, the Old Testament where sin is completely revealed for all that it is. And we have to run with this idea. So, so for this morning, for our sake, because John kind of has this succinct definition, we have to understand that sin really is like, I, I kind of explain it, not in a, this is probably not the best way, a negative and a positive way, right? There's the negative side where we know the, the, the commands of God. When we break God's commands. We definitely, that's a negative. It's sin. But there's also times where we know things we should be doing, but we're inactive. We're not doing them, right? And so on a positive side, we would say, even though I'm sitting on my hands and I know I should go help my neighbor, I'll go do something God has commanded me to do, and I'm not doing it. That also is sin. That's how James kind of defines it. And so we're running with this idea that here, John just simply says, sin is lawlessness. And it's kind of this all-encompassing. And he has this idea that, that I would think he has the desire that all of us are included in this, right? We have fallen so short of God's standard. God demands perfection. You and I, guess what? This might be new to you. You're not perfect. Right? Neither of us are. We're not perfect. And God demands perfection. But yet, John says, look, there is sin. And sin is lawlessness. It is a breaking of all of God's commands. And there's this idea that behind it there is kind of a rebellion. Right? John kind of backs up and he doesn't list out, like, here is the sins. This one here, that's a sin. This one is a sin. If you break this one, this one, this is sin. He kind of steps back from that whole discussion. And he says, behind all of the law is sin. It is rebellion. It is active rebellion against God. That's what he says. It's all God. Paul picks up on this in Romans 5.13 where he says, For until the law, sin was in the world. How do we know what sin is? Right? 
We know from Scripture this is what sin is. And Paul is saying, look, people, we know that sin leads to death, and people were dying before the law came, so we know sin was active in the world even before the law. John has this idea, sin is lawlessness. It is against, it is opposed to everything that is God. And we might look at it this way, you know, for us, how does this work itself out? If we're going to run with this definition, we might simply define it as it's the means of simply if we desire our own way over against God's, right? If we're breaking anything of God's way, John would say that's lawlessness, okay? Because sin is lawlessness. So it can express itself, and probably you've seen this, I'm sure you have. We can see sin in the stubbornness of a child, right? Your parents go, oh, yeah. Not only once, but multiple times, right? We see it. It manifests itself. We can see it in the rebellion of a teen, right? A young person who says, you know what? I got my own way. I'm not just wearing this black leather jacket for the thrills of it, right? It represents my rebellion, right? Not that, that I'm saying you're doing that, but it expresses itself. We see it in older adults, right? Inflexibility. Nope, my way is the right way. And we do this against God, whether we know it or not. And this is what John is saying. Anything that breaks it, there's a way in which you say, this is my, I'm doing it my way, right? And this is how it leads and manifests itself. And John's talking about these Gnostics who are doing the very same thing. This is how it plays itself out in life. This is what is and what is not sin. And so therefore, we're going to just go do this. And John is dealing with that. And he's hitting it going, no, there is this reality of sin. You and I are going to struggle with this. We have to come to terms with it. This plays itself out, right, in our lives. We may have a tendency to break the speed limit. I won't make any eye contact there. <laughs> tendency to cheat on income taxes and so forth. We might use, you know, uh, employees' materials for personal use. I, it can, we can make a long list. And Isaiah says it well, right? Isaiah 53, 6. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned everyone to his own way and the Lord has laid on him, speaking of Christ, the iniquity of us all. We all turned our own way. You think of the days of Gideon where everyone did what was right in their own eyes, right? We're just going to go about it. And we kind of see that tendency. And John is saying that is sin. It is lawlessness. It is against God. It stands behind. It is the rebellion behind all of God's law. Sin, right? That's pretty all-inclusive. We're all guilty of that. James Boyce shares this story. He's talking about the, the characteristics of sin, right? Until God transforms us, we have this, this, this idea that people are stuck. But he uses, uh, shares this story. He says, when a Sunday school teacher once asked a little boy to define sin, he answered, I think it's anything you like to do. <laughs> right? And if it's over against God's law, you would be right, right? Our natural state as sinners before the grace of God is opposed to the holy will of God. And that simply is what John is saying. This is sin. Sin is ugly, right? And I think it manifests itself. We begin to see it when, when maybe there's personal desires in our life. Where the Word of God begins to, to approach those and it begins to attack those. And we, instead of saying, yes, Lord, I'm going to repent, it's when we say, you know what, let's defend those. right? Let's, let's justify this by saying, I'm not really hurting anyone. right? Or whatever excuse we might plug in. These desires aren't that bad or they're okay. I did it once, ah, I'll do it again. Whatever that might be, and you have to realize what John is, why is John taking the spiritual needle and popping all our bubbles, right? Is that he wants you to, to square you know, straight with this. Say, this is sin. It is willful rebellion against God. You have to call it what it is. And when I do this thing, I try to justify, no matter how small or minute the sin we might think might be, John is saying you're, you're actually rebelling. You're willfully, deliberately rebelling against God. And that sounds so harsh. But this is what he's doing. And the reason he is doing it is, is that you, he doesn't want you or himself. Remember, he includes himself. He doesn't want any of us to get to this place where we say, you know what? I think God's lying on this one. God didn't really mean to call this one a sin. Right? The Gnostics who were a part of the, of the fellowship early on, who went out from them, John says, you know what? They left. They're never a part of us. They redefined sin. And John says, I want you. I love you enough to say, look, be real about this. Because it leads to a place of separation from God. It leads to a place where you justify sin. It leads to a place where you ultimately have to say, God wasn't being truthful on this when he's lying. And we would never say that. But John is saying it leads us there. We need a Savior. 
he also goes on, not only if that's if you think that's enough, but he goes on, he creates this fundamental connection with sin, right? He says, look, sin is connected. The person sinning is connected to the devil. Man, right? Look what the devil does. He says, he, he, he says sin, no matter how mild, right, or, or minute we might think it is, is the devil's way. It leads to more transgressions. That's how it works itself out, right? We see one little thing. It's a little bit bigger, it's a little bit more, so on and so forth. And he contrasts that later in this passage where he says that what righteousness of God, those who pursue a God-like character, grow in their purity, grow in their, in their righteousness and, and are practicing it. That is the contrast here that he's going to reveal to us and show us. So he's definitely writing in light with the Gnostic teachers who are under underestimating, if you will, sin or denying it altogether. They may think sin pertains to the body but not to the mind or whatever they might say, but they're saying, you know what, it's not that. Remember John says, if you say you have no sin, you think you have the son, you don't have the father, you think you have the father, you don't have either. It's very important. So he takes this spiritual needle, right, and busts all our bubbles. He wants us to realize that sin is, is not merely negative. It is willful rebellion. And it very much so begins in our thinking. I believe Paul in Romans 12, 2 is right when he says, and do not be conformed to this world, right? John is writing in the context. Here's the world that's passing away. And, John, and Paul is saying the same thing. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, right? How you think on these things. Spend, sin, this is how you need to, to realize what it is. Call it what it is. That you may prove what is good, acceptable in the perfect will of God. So John, very out of the gate, says, look, in these verses, in 4, in the first part of verse 8, says, look, this is sin. And if he was to leave us there, it's very depressing, right? Because we kind of feel that way. If we're honest and mature in our, in our walk, we'd say, yeah, I know. I struggle with this. That's why I call the sin in the Christian life. But John goes on, he says, what? Guess what? There is a Savior. There is a Savior who has conquered. This is verses 5 and the second part of verse 8 where he says, and you know that he was manifested, speaking of Christ, to take away our sins. And in him there is no sin. It's perfect. In the second part of 8, he says, For this purpose the Son of God was manifested, that he might destroy the works of the devil. So here John reminds us, here's the, here's the characteristic of the devil. It is sin, right? Build that association. But he also wants us to understand there is a characteristic of Christ, and this characteristic is to take away our sin. That is good news, right? And John says it like this. Why did Jesus come? He says it like this. Well, he came to take care of our sin problem, and he came to deal with the devil, right? Take care of this problem for us, to which once again we say yes and amen, right? But we want to make sure, how is this done? How is it that Jesus can come and do this? Well, he takes our place, Right? The just for the unjust. He becomes the propitiation. I love that word. I'll say it often. It is God's means for salvation. It is Christ alone. We sang the song earlier. Do you believe that, right? Christ alone. He's the cornerstone. There is no other. He is very, very unique. Second person of the Trinity, right, who has come into this world to pay a price that you and I can never. John has this in mind. He's thinking of clearly of Christ's sacrifice when he says in verse 2 of chapter 2 that Christ died for the world. He mentions propitiation. And he himself is our propitiation for our sins, and not only ours, but only for excuse me, but also for the whole world. The Gnostics were believing this elitism, right? We have this esoteric knowledge, it's just for us. And John's saying, no, it's not just for you. It's for those who come and believe on Christ. For Jesus so loved the world, this is who he is. And John has this in his mind. He's saying, this is how we deal with our sin problem. That's good news. We are not saved by wishful thinking, not by good works, but upon Christ and him alone, his sacrifice. This is God's grace. If we define sin as lawlessness, as willful rebellion, think about how gracious and, and merciful God is to say, you know what? In the context of all these willfully rebellious people, I'm going to send my son. He's going to die at the hands of his own creation that you and I this morning can assemble, lift our voices, lift our lives, and acknowledge Christ has saved me. That is good news. It is the cross where Jesus laid down his life and gave himself as a sacrifice for us who stood against God. We were once alienated from God. 
See, Jesus took upon himself the just punishment for God. It's very important. God didn't lower his standard. He maintained right, his standard. He punished sin because God is holy. God was requiring a just payment for wickedness. If God doesn't punish wickedness, he would not be just. If he were not just, he would cease to be good. Christ had to go to the cross. John says that he was sinless, right? But he took upon our sin, on himself, the just for the unjust. Because God must do right and sin must be punished. And because of that work on the cross, heaven is open to us. It's important to understand here we see how our sin is dealt with, right? I mean, God sends Jesus. He deals with our sin problem we're thinking about this, the birth of our Savior. This is, you know, we come into this season, we think about the action. God puts this in place. He sends his son. This is how he came. And we know that he's going to go to the cross, to which we say, Lord, thank you for saving us. And John says, look, here, the, he's going to destroy the works of the devil. He's going to free the believer. And we know that the devil's still active in this world. It doesn't completely destroy him at this point, right? That is yet to come. Not totally destroyed, but we know that this is the first step in his complete destruction. And we know that we are empowered by his spirit. The sin doesn't own us, the Savior does. So we realize, John says, look, here is the sin problem. I want you to just look at it for what it is, call it what it is. Don't get to a place where you say God is lying and realize that you have a Savior. God has provided the means which you and I might be saved. His name is Jesus. Right? And then John, that's not enough for John. He goes on and he explains further for us this idea of who this God really is. He is the God who abides. Right? God is with us. He abides with us. In verses 6 and 9, he says, Whoever abides in him does not sin. And whoever sin has neither seen him nor known him. And whoever has been born of God does not sin, for his seed remains in him. And he cannot sin because he has been born of God. So if the cross of Christ has dealt with our sin problem and destroys the work of the devil, then the one who has faith in Christ, believes on Christ, must not sin, but live a holy life. And we have to conclude if this person does not, he is against Christ, right? I mean, it's kind of what John is saying. This seems like it's kind of a contradiction. We come to this place where we say, okay, can a Christian sin? Yes, right? We're believers, I, I think. Maybe some of you are going, I think so. Yeah, I think, you know, I've sinned. I did on the way this morning, right? We're talking about sin in the Christian life, but John is making, it's very clear. He's saying there is no place in the Christian life for sin. So how do we reconcile this? Our, our thoughts go straight to 1 John 1.10, right? If we say we have not sinned, we make him a liar and his word is not in us. So can we believe John? Is John consistent here? What does this mean? What am I supposed to do with this? John places himself along with us if we say we have no sin. John is saying, if I have, hey, I've got an advocate, I've got a propitiation. But now he turns around and says, look, if you're the Christian, you should not be sinning. So we have, I don't know, a problem. We have something we have to work through. You know, it's interesting as you get into this text, there's a lot of different interpretations. A lot of different commentators try to come across and say, this is kind of what it means. And there's a few I'd like to just kind of run past you. Some say that sin in this passage kind of means those, those heinous sins, those ones like murder, right? These, these, gross, these big sins. That's what he's dealing with. That's what, that's what the passage means. But did we read anything there that John is talking about specific sins? He doesn't mention any of that stuff. None of that is there, right? And the Bible has a view of sin as murder is just as bad as the sin of pride. I mean, we can go down a list. I mean, in God's eyes, it's sin, right? Some think it's, it's regarded as, uh, or as rather it's regarded differently by God as to the believer as the unbeliever. Well, this sin here is it's, it's kind of it's different. Some take the idea of the old nature, new nature, very similar to this. The new nature has come, that's of God. That's, that's kind of what it's talking about. I mean, the new nature hasn't come yet, and, and so forth. They try to, try to write it away that way. Some have the idea that this is the ideal. We can just get to this place, it's kind of the ideal. Well, someday we'll get there. It's, it's the ideal. You know, I mean, it's kind of like turning the Bible into guidelines, right? It's, yeah, they're kind of, it's like guidelines. Occasionally you can follow it. I mean, it's all right, right? You kind of have that, but they're trying to work through this. 
And some say that it's, you know, it, it's talking about sin that is willful or deliberate. But I think at times, if we're honest with ourselves, we sin willfully. That's what John is saying. It's willful rebellion. We sin deliberately. And we should never get to a place where we don't understand the importance of continuous confession in our lives. So what is John getting at? And I believe the only adequate interpretation of this verse for the Christian is that sin is something that should not be lasting or habitual. There is sin in our lives that is continuing. Sin in a specific area that is habitual. I believe that's what John is getting at. For the believer who has been changed, who has been saved, John uses some present tense verbs to indicate this kind of idea. In verse 6, he says, whoever abides in him, right, does not sin. The idea of continues in sin indefinitely. Whoever has been born of God does not sin. The same idea. John is simply saying that although a Christian may sin, it is nevertheless impossible for the Christian to go on persisting in sin indefinitely. That's what he's getting at. And if you think about it, if, if John, if this is the, the, the right interpretation, which I believe it is, then the test of righteousness makes sense. Our growth in righteousness, our growth in love, our growth in truth, right? We're not there yet, but we deal with these. And these growths and these tests, these indicators help us turn away from those habitual things to continue to pursue purity, to pursue holiness as he has told us. And the reason John gives this, the reason I say that it's God who abides, is he says his seed remains in him. This is the very nature of God abiding in the believer. God's nature in us, sealed by the Holy Spirit, is opposed to sin. He'll not let you rest in sin. He'll expose sin. We call that conviction, right? Turning away needs to happen. Repentance needs to happen when these things happen or being revealed in our lives. So if a person has been born of God, then something radical has taken place. They've received a new nature. We're set on a new course. It is a course of holiness. Right? We have confidence in that, but it's also revealing. If these things are not happening in us, maybe we have to stop and say, do I really know? Am I really born of God? John's desire is that you would look at this and you would have a heart that says, you know what, I don't want to rebel against my Savior. I understand what my sin is. And I want to follow his commands. I want to grow in my love for my brothers and sisters. I want to grow in my love for his truth. I want to study his word and, and be serious about it. And those times that come where, where we fall into sin, I want to deal with it. Well, as the scripture says, I should come and confess that sin. Acknowledge my need for a Savior. Set my eyes upon him. Follow after him. And this is what John is saying. Believers should be doing this. We realize that we live in this life. We are broken. We struggle with sin. It's around us. But it's what we do with it as a believer, right? We confess these sin. And John naturally, his thinking naturally goes into what I can call application. He naturally goes into what are you supposed to do about it. And I just called this last point, the believer's call to righteousness. He says in verses 7 and in verses 10, he says, Little children... Let no one deceive you. He who practices righteousness is righteous, just as he is righteous. And in this, the children of God and the children of the devil are manifest. Whoever does not practice righteousness is not of God, nor is he who does not love his brother. I think there is a wonderful appeal to, to sound thinking here. John wants you to understand that you have to come, once again, squarely think about what sin is. Squarely understand the Savior who has conquered your sin. And understand that there is a presence in you. There is a, a spirit, right? the third person of the Trinity who dwells in you. Desires to bring conviction, to change your life, to change your course. You would not be habitually stuck in some of these sins that are, that are trying to, to cling on to us. 
You know, and he's dealing also with the idea that there are Gnostics, right, who kind of just wrote off their sinful conduct. They wrote it and said, you know, it's just not only it's not sin, it's actually the right thing to do. And, and this led to a lot of confusion for these Christians. They're going around going, well, what is it? Am I really part of the family of God? Am I really born again or am I not? And John wants us to be completely clear on this. He doesn't want anyone to be confused. He wants you to think of this. And in spiritual terms, he boils it down for us. And he says there's two groups of people. That's what it is. There's two groups of people, those who are God's children and those who are not. Right? We've said many times, or I've said many times, there's no gray area with John. We don't get into heaven on a technicality. We used to joke in Bible college about one man. We'd tease him a lot and said, man, if you get into heaven before me, you're going to be my Achilles heel. I'm just going to tell God if you let Gabe in, right? His name was Gabe. I'm going to be there too, right? He's going to let me in. And it doesn't work like that. It's those who know Christ and those who do not. There it is for John, the rest of Scripture, and this is what it is. We talked about last week, this Savior who is coming back. He says, we know he's coming when he's going to be revealed. He's going to look you in the eyes, and you don't want to be one who's ashamed, so grow in your purity. And here John is saying the same thing in this context, right? Grow in your righteousness. Be convinced of this in your thinking. Realize that the new birth has come to you. You are a child of the King, It's not a matter of just knowing it, right, for John. It's not just knowing it. It has this idea of of knowledge that works itself out, but the Gnostics were stuck. They were the knowing ones. He's saying it's not just knowledge. It is the working out of God's truth. One enters into Christianity by being born of God, and this is done and, and accomplished by believing on Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior. must never confuse those facts. This is how it is done. And John wants us to be sure of this. And you become sure of this when it's backed by evidence, the growth of a holy life, of a righteous life, of a pure life. As you grow in these things, not to earn, but with the right motivation, because I understand what God has done. You know, in our day and age, there are many who might profess to know Christ. You hear statistics that say that, that our nation is, you know, 80-some-odd percent born-again believers. They'll profess to that. And you, then you look at our nation and go, I, I can't reconcile that figure. And why is that? Because there are those who believe, who think they're saved. Well, I went to church. I'm not getting on extra credit. My family went once. I get credit for reading the Bible. It's, I'm good, right? Whatever they might use. And so therefore, when a, when, a, when a statistic comes around, they say, well, yeah, I'm, yes, I am. But sometimes that's done in a negative way. They might assess it by saying, well, since I'm not a Muslim or I'm not a Jew or an atheist, I believe there's a God, right? They, re- they reason with themselves that, that they are saved. But John says, look, it's, it's not a matter of coming to this place and saying, you know, well, I've, I'm not that, I'm not that, therefore I'm this. He's saying, no, you have to know that you've believed, and when you have believed upon Christ and you understand the gospel of Jesus and how he has saved you and how he extends that grace daily and his mercy in your life that desires good things, and even though we walk through difficulties, he is a God who is ever-present and will walk with you. When you begin to understand that, there are evidences in your life that show themselves. You don't have to put them on. You don't have to use that example. Like on Sunday, I put my, my my Christian coat on, I put on the show, it should never be there, right? John is saying you probably don't believe if you feel you have to do that. We are broken. We do struggle with sin, but there is a Savior who has conquered. There is a God who abides. And because of this, and because I know he's coming, John says, man, we'll live this life out. Live in a way where this truth is yours. I don't have to follow the king. I get to follow the king. John said, make it real in your life. He gives us this sober warning. Whoever does not practice righteousness, does not practice righteousness, is not of God. This is the same at the end of chapter 2, right? If you know he is righteous, then those who practice righteousness, he brings it right back in. Now it's in the context of knowing he's coming back. It's a warning for all of us. This morning, if these things aren't, aren't stirring in you, then it's time to take assessment and say, maybe I haven't believed. And to that I would say, today is the day of salvation. You need to come and believe on Christ. Confess your sins. Make him the Lord of your life. Trust your whole life to him and in nothing else but in Christ alone. And for us this morning who know him, you feel the stir and the desire to pursue and follow here for us, we have to answer this question, how do, John, how do we live this out? And here's my applications. I believe the first thing is you have to understand there has to be in our lives conviction, right? Conviction is a good thing. 
Speaking of spiritual conviction, conviction of sin, conviction to do, right? Conviction to say, you know what, I know the right thing to do. And even though I'm not, I don't feel it, I'm, I need to go do that, right? Let's go forward, have conviction. Let it lead your life and govern your life. And it's ultimately conviction from God's word, right? So we have to follow up to conviction is confession. If we are in sin and we struggle with sin, if that's a part of who we have to deal with in this life, we should be mournful over our sin and turn from that ugliness, and follow after our Savior. And we have those difficult days, we should come to an attitude of repentance, right? Turn from that. Keep battling that. I love this quote from Warren Worsby where he says, Unconfessed sin is the first step in what the Bible calls backsliding, gradually moving away from a close walk with Christ into a life filled with the world in which we live, right? That's how John defines sin as well. It is lawlessness, it is a separation. From God. So let's confess our sin, get back on track. I always use the example of the flat tire, right? Have you ever gotten a flat tire? You don't hop out of your car and say it's useless and pop the other three, right? You just don't do that. You fix that tire. And in those difficult days in your spiritual walk, you'll be amazed, right? You'll be amazed at how many people will have had a bad day and they just think, you know what, I can't even go to church. To me, that's like, well, you know, you're just popping the other four tire or three tires of your car. No, repent. Because that's where you need to be. The church is, yeah, you're right. There's some broken people there. I mean, I'm one of them. I need that Savior. And I need that propitiation. I need him. And I know what he has done, and I want to spur each other on to good things. And so we have an attitude of confession about our sin. Naturally leads to submission. I use this word submission. is a deliberately agreeing with God and surrendering to his word. Every area of your life, submit to God's authority. There's a story I think the words be shared this as well. I talked about a converted Indian who explained, I have two dogs living in me, a mean dog and a good dog, and they're always fighting. The mean dog wants to do bad things, and the good dog, of course, wants to do good things. And he goes and says this question, do you want to know which dog wins? And he gives us the answer. He says, the one I feed the most, right? The good dog wins when I feed it by God's word, submit to his word, a Christian who feeds in the new nature, his nature in Christ, her nature in Christ, from the word of God, will feel the power to live a righteous life. Paul tells us, put on the Lord Jesus Christ, make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Right? It takes action. I love Luke 10, 27. It sums up our submitting, right? We are to love the Lord your God with your hearts, all your hearts, all your soul, all your strength, with all your mind. Your neighbor as yourself, right? God, Jesus sums up the law for us quite succinctly. I love that. What does that take? It takes all that you are submitting, right, in this life to live a righteous life. And, of course, the last one, I'm using the word implement, implementation. This is the spiritual exercise. Implement God's truth. Put it into practice, right? Begin sharing your faith. Begin going the extra mile. Begin loving your neighbor like you love yourself. Begin treating your spouse differently. Begin raising your children differently. Begin treating your finances differently. Begin to honor God in every area of your life. Be serious about these things. Go and do good works in Christ's name. And what a wonderful time of year to do those things, right? Spur that on. Help others, other believers to grow up in their faith, right? Love the church. Every believer has a gift, a spiritual gift in which to contribute and help others in the church body. 1 Peter 4.10. Peter says this, Each one has received a gift. Minister to one another as good stewards in the manifold grace of God. If you understand the grace given to you, extend that grace through your gifts, what God has given you to help one another follow after Christ. It begins with our right understanding. All this begins with our right understanding. But if I define sin as willful rebellion, to change the way I think about this, if I understand that there is a Savior who has come, who has conquered this sin for me, if I understand that the Holy Spirit is sealed, there's a God who abides in me. I would be empowered, empowered to change. I need to submit. I need to have conviction over sin. I need to confess that sin. I need to realize that when I confess it, in all seriousness, it is gone. I may struggle with it. It may come back, but I continue. The power of God, turn from that sin, follow after Jesus. There was a story of a jewelry store owner who was preparing to go on vacation, and she left 
a task for her staff to reform before she left or while she was gone. She had a line of jewelry that hadn't been selling well at all, and she wanted the price cut in half. But in her haste, she left a note that was unclear. So she went on her journey, and when she returned, she was delighted to find that every piece of jewelry was gone. She was even more shocked to find that the staff doubled the price of the jewelry. The pieces that hadn't been selling went out the door immediately once the price was raised because it changed the way people thought about them. Must be something important here. I'm going to pay twice as much. (laughs) See, our thoughts determine our actions. Right? The living out a righteous life is just to understand the grace God has extended to you. You are not an accident. You are not a fluke. You are a child of the King. God it didn't lower his standard. No, he maintains his justice. He is the just and the justifier, and he punishes his son because of us. That becomes wonderful motivation to understand that not, that's not enough for God. He seals us. The third person of the Trinity seals us that we would follow. And John's saying, when you understand this, when you think on this, this is how John can get to this knowledge and say, look, I know You can know you have eternal life. You can know this because of this work, what is happening in your life. It must be done for the right motivation. Luke 6, 45 says, A good man out of the good treasure of his heart brings forth good, and an evil man out out of the evil treasure of his heart brings forth evil. For out of the abundance of the heart, your mouth is going to speak. Right? Confession of our sin, conviction over that, submitting to God's word, reading God's word, following God's word. And I love reading in the Old Testament and reading through the through uh, first and second kings and going through chronicles and I'm amazed at Josiah at the end of, of Second Kings where they rediscover God's word and they mourn because they they learn after reading it, they have been in sin. The nation had been in sin. You know, they're broken over that. Josiah is broken. And how often do we, right? It's an indicator. Do we come to sin and say, you know what? I need to be broken over this. I need to begin to think differently. I should have some conviction over that. And when I struggle in this area, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to confess it. I'm going to continue to submit to God's truth of his word. I'm going to continue to grow in my righteousness. I do that by practicing. I'm going to flex that muscle, right? I'm going to implement it, his truth. If you want to live and be marked by righteousness, you must think, right, God's thoughts. Think on his word. Think righteous thoughts. It begins there. 